Hello, in today's video we are looking at proteins. We're going to look at the kind of role they play in the body and we're also going to look in detail at the structure of our proteins. Now, the first thing to remember from our GCSE studies is that proteins are made of these chains of amino acids. So these are the individual units or what we call the monomers that build up chains of uh, build up chains that make up proteins. There are 20 that we naturally occurring ones that we generally talk about. So there are 20 different types that can be made into chains, and they are made of the elements carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen for sure. And often there are other elements in there as well, but they definitely have those four elements. Okay, and once we've uh, built up our chains of amino acids into proteins, they play specific roles in the body. One example would be enzymes. That's a very major topic that we'll be looking at. But enzymes play a big role in the chemistry in the body, the biochemistry that keeps us alive. We have other structures and sorry, other functions as well. We have hormones that are very important. We have uh, something quite specific like transport channels that are found in the cell membrane and these help to transport substances in and out. We have a structural proteins and two examples are keratin and collagen. Collagen is required for cartilage, keratin, keratin for hair and nails. And another quite specific example is hemoglobin, very important as you know in transporting oxygen around the body. Okay, so lots of uh, important functions here. These, this is not all the functions, but some of the uh, important ones that happen. Um, and that's why proteins are so important for living things. Now, in terms of looking at the structure, we can look at that in a bit more detail. What I've got here is one example of a protein and I've taken one little specific part of it and enlarged it. And remember we said during our GCSE studies that these were made of chains of amino acids and I actually showed these chains um, or these different amino acids as different shapes just to show that they were not all the same structure but we need to know in a bit more detail how these um, are so if we look uh, what they actually are we've got a little structure here. you can't see that very clearly but I'm going to expand that we can replace our shapes with these amino acids so what do they look like here is the general structure for an amino acid and you have to know remember how to draw this what we have is over this side what's called our amino group over this this side we have our carboxylic uh, sorry carboxyl group this is the part that gives the acid section of the molecule so you can see the name comes from these two parts amino and acid comes from this the fact that we've got an amino group and a carboxyl group which is acidic the other parts we have are the carbon atom in the middle a hydrogen atom and this is called the R group and this is what gives each individual amino acid its specific characteristics so if uh, you were to look at different amino acids they would each have a different R group. I tend to draw our amino acids like this. The reason why I draw it like this is perfectly acceptable for you to do it, draw it like this. Um, the reason why I draw it like this is because you can show how amino acids react together to form what we call dipeptides and it's much easier to show it on a diagram that looks like this. Just um, going back to our original diagram here and looking at our, at our R group Here's a couple of examples of what the R group might look like for different amino acids. So for one over here, we've just got an H as the R group. It could be a little bit more complicated. It could be something like a CH2, and it could be more complicated still. We've got a hexagonal um, part of the molecule here, uh, which gives a specific feature to this particular amino acid. Okay, not necessary to remember all these or any of these different R groups, but just be aware that the R group is a thing that varies and gives each amino acid its specific features. So some important bits to remember here, you must remember how to draw this diagram. It might be worth just um, pausing perhaps and uh, trying to draw it out for yourself, uh, but you must know how to do that. The next thing we're going to look at is actually how these amino acids can join together 
to make um, long chains of amino acids. And going back to our old GCSE diagram here, we can now take away these shapes and replace it with amino acids. This doesn't look like very much uh, at all here, but we can expand on that and see what's going on. So let's look at uh, two amino acids together. Details of the R group, not so important here, but um, we have two amino acids and the way they can react and combine together is by, or is in a similar way to what we saw before. The two H's there and the oxygen can be removed and when you remove those, you get a molecule of water. And that reaction is the same reaction as we looked at for our carbohydrates. That's called a condensation reaction. It's the removal of a molecule of water. And once we remove that, the two amino acids can join together. And when they're joined, it looks like that. And what we have is a bond created, and that bond is called a peptide bond and what we've produced now with two amino acids and a peptide bomb bond we've produced a di peptide the prefix di meaning two and we can continue in this way to produce what we call a polypeptide and a polypeptide would be a great big long chain of these amino acids, the prefix poly meaning many. It's probably worth just reminding ourselves here actually that this individual amino acid, this individual unit is often referred to as a monomer and our polypeptide is often referred to as a polymer. There are lots of different um, examples or situations in the body where we convert monomers to polymers. We've got glucose being converted into something like glycogen or starch in plants. We've got uh, pro amino acids changing into or being converted to polypeptides, that's monomer to polymer. And we also have the similar um, example with DNA as well, which again we'll look at in another video. But again, some quite inf important information here, and you must be able to draw these two out and show how the peptide bond is produced. The next thing I want to look at is the primary, secondary, and what we call the tertiary structures. And we said that on the last slide, we can join up lots of amino acids to make a long chain of amino acids, which we call a polypeptide, which we have here. But the next stage in the production of a protein is actually to fold this long chain in a particular way. So I can fold it, twist it, and one particular way of doing it is to fold it into a, like a helix shape, and that would end up looking like this. So I haven't drawn it out as the amino acids themselves. If I was to do that, it would take me a long time, and it might look a little bit confusing, but what we would have is the chains of amino acids um, along the ribbon uh, shaped uh, structure like that. So we don't actually draw out the chains often, we actually just do the overall structure which looks like this. And this has a name, it's called the alpha helix. Okay, so this is one type of way in which we can fold our um, amino acid chain to make our alpha helix. And this level of structure is called the secondary. It's called the secondary structure. So if this is the secondary structure, this then would be the primary structure. The primary structure is the specific order in which the amino acids are put. They're not just put in any random order. The body produces different proteins by having specific amino acids in a specific order. Only in that way will the protein then be able to fold into the secondary structure and into the third level which is the tertiary structure. Just want to mention actually there is one more type of secondary structure and this is called the pleated sheet or the beta pleated sheet. Okay and the way the amino acids would be arranged along here would be in this zigzag pattern like so. There are a couple of chains here and they are held together with these bonds that we call hydrogen bonds. 
Okay, so these hydrogen bonds are important in holding together this pleated sheet in this particular way. We also have hydrogen bonds in our alpha helix, and they might appear like so. And these hydrogen bonds are formed between different amino acids in the molecule. Okay, so that's quite an important point to note. We have hydrogen bonds, they're quite weak, but there are many, many, many of them inside our proteins which help to hold the protein together in a specific way. Okay, so we've got our primary structure here, our secondary structures here, two examples, and the next thing after that is our tertiary structure. And the tertiary structure is the way in which these alpha helices and the beta pleated sheets are folded once more. So there's another level of folding here, and you can see that it's made this particular shape. Now, in order to make this particular shape and fold the protein in the right way, we have to have a certain number of chemical bonds, and those are these bonds here. We have what we call a disulfide bond, or sometimes called a disulfide link or a di disulfide bridge. It's another name for it. But where we have the element sulfur in some of our amino acids, we can join the two sulfurs together to make this disulfide bond. It's a covalent bond, it's very strong, so it's good at holding the protein together. So imagine we had one there. This is held together quite strongly in our tertiary structure. Uh, we have an ionic bond, this is a bit weaker, um, and it's affected by uh, changes in pH. So if we have extreme changes in pH, where an enzyme is living, that could affect the bonds and it could damage the shape of the enzyme. We have our hydrogen bonds. These are weak, but there's lots of them, and we mentioned that already. And in this way, we have uh, bonds that can hold the protein together in its specific shape. So you can imagine if I was trying to hold this together with these various bonds, we've got lots of hydrogen bonds here. I'm making this up. This is not a specific amino acid uh, protein, but lots of hydrogen bonds holding it together, a few maybe disulfide bridges and so on, holding it together there. And we might have some ionic bonds in between there as well. Don't know why I'm, don't know how I'm drawing that, but anyway, you get the point. Okay, so this is held together um, in a very specific shape by our different types of bond. Now what we have next after our tertiary structure, so we've looked at three levels, primary, secondary, and tertiary. We can then uh, possibly have the protein producing a quaternary structure, and that's when we have several tertiary structures joined together like so, again, possibly involving those kinds of bonds that we talked about. But um, if I just draw the outlines there, you can see now how we've got these three tertiary structures joined together to make a quaternary structure. One important example of something that has quaternary structure is hemoglobin. And we're going to look at that in detail in another video. Uh, this is not hemoglobin. Hemoglobin actually has four parts, four tertiary structures which are joined. But like I say, we'll look at that in a future video. Um, but this is an example of our quaternary structure. Um, and this, in fact, is what we call a globular protein and globular proteins are involved in chemical reactions They're involved in the me metabolism which are all the chemical reactions that go on in the body we have another type of uh, protein as well and we call that a fibrous protein and that's not necessarily in the same shape or similar shape to what we've drawn uh, a fibrous protein might have something, a shape that looks something like this. Actually, I've already got one there. A fibrous protein might have a shape that looks like this. And fibrous proteins are structural. So their role is more structural. It's more to do with holding things together, keeping things firm and strong. Uh, we gave the example of cartilage. And keratin which is the tough uh, stuff your nails are made out of. So that's more of a structural role. It doesn't play a role in chemical reactions. But one famous example or one important example of this is collagen. And the collagen molecule 
or the collagen protein looks a bit like this so here's one part of it you can see oops you can see we've got one to three alpha helices that are intertwined with each other tightly intertwined with each other held together with bonds and what we get next is a whole bunch of those together and you can see that this now actually produces quite a strong structure which is held together quite strongly in order for collagen to be able to do its structural role okay so that there is a overview of proteins and protein structure lots and lots of information in there for you to uh, make sure you know and understand so you may need to go over this one or two more times um, proteins is a very important uh, topic the whole idea of amino acids and building proteins and enzymes and so on uh, is very important so you must make sure you have a clear understanding of this however that's me done for today's video thank you for watching and I'll see you again soon